Some might say I was born with the superpower of resiliency. I was born during a blizzard in April. Possibly a predictor of things to come? Hmm. As an infant, I had hip dysplasia, so my first five months of life were spent in a hip sling. As soon as that thing was off, I skipped um, crawling and just started walking. I had eye surgery at the age of two, chronic ear, nose, and throat infections that led to surgery by the age of 11. I was overweight from childhood and bullied so badly that I contemplated suicide daily during sixth grade. Life improved for me in high school and college till I was blindsided by the death of my parents to cancers. An orphan by age 23, I had so many learning curves. I survived events that should only exist in horror movies, like 9-11, gun violence, sex assault, being a hostage, a hurricane, uh, three tornadoes, two lightning strikes, domestic violence, poverty, homelessness, an elevator accident, too many choking and drowning incidents. How am I alive? <laughs> well, I'll let you in on a little secret. Me and Death have an ongoing friendly competition, and so far I'm winning. My prize? <laughs> Becoming the underdog's unsung hero. The impact from all those life experiences was profound. I developed grit. The process of survival, reflection, healing, grieving, and internal work to overcome those traumatic events took time. But I never gave up on myself. I got counseling, became self-reliant, -rel started speaking up, asked for help. It was up to me to stand up for myself or no one else would. I became an expert in resilience and survival. Not because I wanted to, but because I had no other choice. My foundation in resiliency and self-advocacy prepared me for taking on the most unexpected battle of my life, my health, and overcoming the burdens of proof and prejudice in healthcare. What are these burdens? The burden of proof refers to the responsibility shared by patients and providers to collect evidence that proves a diagnosis or that a particular treatment is medically necessary. Patients must communicate with their doctors about any symptoms and show proof when possible. Doctors require tangible evidence via exams, labs, imaging, or special testing to diagnose and treat patients. If the burden of proof can't be fulfilled, the patient may be left without a diagnosis or treatment. The burden of prejudice refers to the impact of prejudice or discrimination bias affecting patients, whether or not the prejudice was intentionally harmful. The type of prejudice you're most likely familiar with refers to the negative impact of intentional discrimination, where a hostile and or rational attitude or action is purposefully directed at individuals or groups based on any of their actual or perceived characteristics, such as race, ethnicity, uh, religion, body type, orientation, and so forth. What you may be unfamiliar with are the healthcare decisions where the prejudice is medical in nature and not intended to be harmful. For example, a provider giving a diagnosis when they're lacking up-to-date knowledge about a disease and the prejudice results in a misdiagnosis that causes irrevocable damage to their patient. Another example is the exclusion of a particular group of people because of the criteria involved, such as having a specific blood type. The exclusion isn't founded in a hateful or irrational bias, as it serves a purpose. When we are young and or presumably healthy, we don't consider the possibility that our own bodies may one day betray us, causing constant suffering or repeated brushes with death. We aren't taught what to do if we find ourselves in poor health or how to overcome the burdens of proof and prejudice that await us. I learned the hard way, and I want to make it easier for you in case you ever find yourself in my position. To the average person, I look perfectly normal. I seem like another plush-sized pretty boss lady, you know, going about her business, doing her thing, putting in work. 
People make snap judgments all the time about what women who look like me can or can't do, especially on the days I dare to walk without my cane. I have one. I might seem average, but I assure you, I am as rare as it gets. My hematologist calls me the Pegasus patient because I'm so rare, a doctor may see a patient like me once in their lifetime. I am chronically sick, injured, and disabled. Some common health conditions I have are type 2 diabetes, asthma, hypertension, gastroparesis, anemia, polycystic ovarian syndrome, neuropathy, carpal tunnel, GERD, tachycardia, anyone have a hand, DVT, and alopecia. I also have multiple injuries from a 2017 elevator accident. That includes injuries to my spine, both knees, hips and shoulders, and a concussion that caused a mild traumatic brain injury, or MTBI. Sidebar, um, there's literally nothing mild about my MTBI, so don't get into an elevator accident. Highly don't recommend. Mm -mm, not a fan, not a fan. And last but not, but not least, I have two devastating diseases you may have never heard of before today, which took me the longest to get diagnosed due to the burdens of proof and prejudice. The first of these awful diseases is an ultra-rare autoimmune neuromuscular disease that causes severe muscle weakness called LRP4-positive myasthenia gravis, or MG, for short. For seven years, I had all of the clinical symptoms of MG, but tested negative for antibodies and negative four times on an EMG test that helps confirm the MG diagnosis. Instead of being considered to have seronegative MG, I endured numerous ER visits, hospitalizations, and consults where I was repeatedly gaslit, dismissed, and refused treatment. Finally, in 2018, a compassionate neuromuscular specialist took me on as a patient. Testing became available for a newly discovered MG antibody, and we learned I was LRP4 positive. On my fifth EMG test, my MG diagnosis was confirmed, and I began treatment. One major burden of proof with MG was the ability to show my symptoms. My symptoms rarely showed up all at once, or severe enough during appointments to confirm clinical symptoms. The providers wanted to see it to believe it, but I was missing the proof. I didn't know how to help my doctors help me. I reached out for guidance from the MG community. Learning ways to better advocate for myself, I started a symptom journal, taking selfies and videos. Gathering evidence to show my symptoms in action was key in getting my providers to listen and take me seriously. The last comorbidity of mine is the one that took me the longest to get diagnosed. This disease is actually quite common in America, but often misunderstood. It's called Sjogren's disease, formerly Sjogren's syndrome. The Sjogren's Foundation says that as many as 4 million Americans have Sjogren's syndrome, with an estimated 2.5 million um, patients undiagnosed. Nine out of 10 Sjogren's patients are women. Most doctors still think Sjogren's is a disease that only causes extremely dry eyes and mouth, but it's so much more. According to the Sjogren's Foundation, symptoms often vary from patient to patient, including in severity. While many patients experience dry eyes, dry mouth, fatigue, and joint pain, Sjogren's can also cause dysfunction of organs such as the kidneys, gastro gastrointestinal system, blood vessels, lungs, liver, pancreas, and the central nervous system. Patients also have a higher chance of developing lymphoma. What is most interesting to me is that my Sjogren's diagnosis was confirmed in August 2021, but many clinical Sjogren symptoms were evident since early childhood. This year, at 39 years old, I began experiencing new and worsening symptoms. I was examined by multiple specialists who ran labs, imaging, specialized testing. 
I tested positive for the SSA antibody and had a positive lip biopsy. My Sjogren's diagnosis was confirmed. While I am happy to be diagnosed and getting treatment, I wonder how on earth did this diagnosis evade 30 years worth of doctors? Why did I suffer needlessly with undiagnosed Sjogren's if it's such a common disease? I had done a really good job with my self-advocacy, so what went wrong? The burden of prejudice was the biggest barrier to my Sjogren's diagnosis. The doctors evaluated my symptoms, but individually, and failed to see them as coming from one single systemic disease. Sjogren's has a lot of symptom overlap with other diseases because of the many organs and systems involved. So if a provider doesn't know enough about Sjogren's, they won't suspect it and therefore won't test for it. My provider's lack of education and updated info about Sjogren's disease was detrimental to my health care, resulting in severely delayed diagnosis and a lack of appropriate treatments causing permanent bodily damage due to pro disease progression. In my attempt to get correctly diagnosed, I experienced medical gaslighting. Providers insisted their diagnosis was correct when I knew in my gut it wasn't. I was told I couldn't possibly have MG or Sjogren's and that my symptoms were due to obesity, anxiety, or in my head. When I brought medical records and peer-reviewed articles to my appointments, I was treated like a hypochondriac reminded of my status as a female and told not to be a Google doctor. I let my doctors know I had an MS in counseling and I knew how to conduct scholarly research, but they didn't care. Their title held authority and mine meant nothing. I was discriminated against for being a woman in pain and dismissed as a drug seeker. The burden of prejudice I experienced was so awful it influenced my avoidance of healthcare and decision to leave the USA and move to a third world country. Despite not having a confirmed diagnosis or treatment, I knew that what I had was real and it was serious. I thought I was dying. I preferred to spend whatever time I had left in the tropics with someone I loved who I thought loved me. I almost died, but thankfully, I didn't. 2015, I returned to the U.S. to restart my life and pursuit of the right diagnoses. The burden of prejudice due to gender bias is happening to women everywhere. A 2018 article from the New York Times by Camille No Pagan said that, research shows that both doctors and nurses prescribe less pain medication to women than men after surgery, even though women report more frequent and severe pain levels and a University of Pennsylvania study found that women waited 16 minutes longer than men to receive pain medication when they visited an emergency room. Women are also more likely to be told their pain is psychosomatic or influenced by emotional distress. And in a survey of more than 2,400 women with chronic pain, 83% said they felt they had experienced gender discrimination from their healthcare providers. Another important burden of prejudice is racism. It can still be found in all aspects of healthcare, from individuals to hospitals institutions, textbooks, med schools, health policies, clinical trials, studies, and the list goes on and on. Racism plays a detrimental role in the quality of and access to health care people of color are experiencing. Unsurprisingly, the intersectionality of racism and gender bias towards women has created the most undeniable and unconscionable disparity in health care, according to a May 2021 article in the Slatest by Julia Craven. Black people who give birth in the U.S. are three times as likely to experience maternal death during or, af or after delivery as their white peers, who themselves die at a higher rate than in any other comparably wealthy nation. 
There's no definitive reason for this atrocious outcome. But systemic racism, poor healthcare access, apathetic clinicians, and weathering all play a role in why the phenomenon transcends class and educational lines. In a 2019 study on how birthing people are treated by clinicians, 22.5% of black patients reported experiencing some type of mistreatment. Black babies are also at risk since they are more likely to be born premature and more likely to die when treated by white doctors. And when black women have access to black doulas, they are more likely to survive birth and the period afterward. We cannot ignore this travesty. Patients like me, with complex health conditions, rare diseases, injuries, and disabilities, as well as those who are healthy, often experience challenges with overcoming the burdens of proof and prejudice. Let this be our call to action, to uproot our current system and release ourselves from these burdens. In the meantime, we can be proactive, self-advocate, ask questions, research, speak up for ourselves, show your proof, bring your records, symptom journals, pics, and vids. If we all participate in the improvement of healthcare in ways that are meaningful, we can rise together in resilience and empower one another as we strive for better health. Thank you. Thank you.